We make electric furnaces and we use high efficiency insulation so that the heat stays in the furnace, doesn't heat up your room. It does a job because it's enclosed and it doesn't let the heat out. In the good old days, they built a furnace out of brick, probably weighed around two tons and would get up to maybe as high as 1200, 1300 degrees centigrade. We have a furnace, our first one, has two inches of insulation, will go to 1700 degrees centigrade in 15 minutes and then back down again in another five. And this was based on two things in the space age. The ceramic elements, th these are actually molydicylicide, and molybdenum disilicide is a, actually two metals, but once it gets hot, the silicon becomes silica and then coats it with a impervial uh, coating so that it doesn't get oxidized on the molybdenum. Then the molybdenum can heat up and heat your furnace. And as this gets hotter and hotter, of course, it's like a light bulb. You turn it on, you turn it off, and the film stays on there and protects it. So you've got a light bulb within a heating element. And then our insulation, of course, is the space age type insulation aluminum silicates and the same things that are on the space shuttle and this type of thing. And two inches of our insulation is the equivalent of about 18 to 20 inches of brick. And once we started with our small furnaces, the first one was incidentally was uh, designed for coarse porcelain so that they could duplicate a tunnel kiln that takes eight days in eight hours per shift and they could run it three times a day. And the materials we, we were using were very, very fragile. So they would have two or three furnaces. We would be rebuilding one every day while they used one. <laughs> These same furnaces now with our modern design last three and four and five years. <laughs> and one of the first jobs we had, of course, was, was what was very good for us publicity wise was the, the furnace is designed for NASA to evaluate the rocks that they brought back from the moons on the, the moon shuttle runs. And it was important because these furnaces could be built instantly and if they overheated them and made a mistake, of course, they can take them apart, put one back together in about, you know, two or three hours. But the big thing was the furnace was designed with molydicylicide elements space age insulation and NASA technology for evaluating all of their uh, specimens that they collected from the moon, the earth, or wherever they collected them. And they tested the fugacity and the things so they could find out what the rocks were like that came back from the moon. As it turned out, some people think that they were slightly older, but basically the same. <laughs> They would say, this is the problem we have. Have you got a furnace that would fulfill that need? And basically, we would design what we thought they need as close as it is, and then they would modify it to do exactly what they wanted it to do. They took one of our furnaces and inserted a tube inside of it so they could control the atmosphere. We were already nullifying all the magnetic fields, so that helped them that far. And then, by measuring the oxygen fugacity, they could find out, you know, exactly what was going on with the rocks. Like when they were forming, they would bring the rock up, melt it, and then quench it, then analyze it for magnetic properties and all of those things. It was basically a furnace to fill a need, which is, in my case, a bit of publicity because that's our motto. <laughs> and the other type where they actually need, at Sandia Laboratory, they had to have a high temperature glass melting furnace that they had to be able to drop out of the furnace almost instantly and then cast it before it froze because of its high viscosity. So we designed a, a furnace for them that used the same insulation, the same insulation, but the insulation would react with the glass. 
So we had to put a ceramic liner in it that was made by Coors Porcelain to defend the insulation from the glass. So we built an ins upside down furnace. We had the hard ceramic on the inside, and the soft ceramic and insulation on the outside. We had the hard ceramic on the inside to protect the furnace instead of the brick, you know, on the outside to be the furnace. And then we put the insulation around it and the furnace would operate to 1725 degrees centigrade and they could kick a switch and the bottom would drop out. They could then grab it with a pair of tongs and cast it, set it back, set another one on and it would go right back up to 1725 degrees. And those furnaces would last up to a year, year and a half. But one of the problems we found with it is that the elements would be attacked by the glass and they'd only be attacked on one side. So if you turn the furnaces off, then the glass had two compositions, one on one side and one on the other. And then when you cool them off, they expanded at different rates and they'd bend and they'd drop off all the elements. So the furnaces were usually left at a thousand degrees 24 hours a day. But at one time in their laboratory, they had about 16 of them in a row on the wall. And of course, once they got through with that, uh, they moved on to other things. And they, as everything else in life, they no longer have a glass laboratory. <laughs> but there's other places where we also have done a lot of work is in fuel cells. Because we can make the, the product that they need, the zirconia and, and all of those things, and make it at a rate and, and un temperature uniformity. And one of the biggest furnaces that we ever built was 20 foot in diameter and 3 foot tall and went to 1700 degrees centigrade. It was used to slope the glass for the Hubble type telescope up to a two meter lens. And the thing about it was that uh, they had to be able to carry all of this stuff and have a uniform temperature. And so I built them an extra heavy insulation. I've told you about our smaller furnace with two insulation. I built them one with six inches of the same type of insulation. That way, when they measured the temperature within the furnace, from the top to the bottom, within two inches of the bottom, there was less than a 10 degree centigrade temperature differential at 1725 degrees. So the glass just slumped together and formed a lens. <laughs> that was our big one, and our little one starts at six inches by six inches by six inches. And that was the one that's used for tube furnaces at NASA also used for other other people, you know, that just want a small furnace that'll go to 15, 16, 1700 degrees centigrade and you can open it and close it without heating up the room. Is once again, it's a matter of the, the great insulation and a minimum amount of steel. We avoid steel shells simply because if you put your hand on a steel plate, the steel will transfer every bit of heat from that plate to your hand. But if we use an outside insulating board, you put your hand on it, it will transfer what that film is and then it quits. So you can't get burnt and it stops the heat also from radiating out in the room. So instead of having a furnace that's heating the room, you have a furnace that heats your product. The major changes have been made since we first started out with our little furnaces and, and the big furnaces are, now they have specific needs, like they'll have a furnace that they want to have pressure on. And we designed a special furnace for the people that make the powders that coat. Every jet engine has these fan blades and they have a special powder that they spray on them to, to prevent the titanium from being attacked. And so, our furnaces are used to make that material to spray it on it. But the material requires a little bit of oxygen pressures to cut down their furnace in time from one or two days and weeks to a day and a half or two. So in order to do this, we just 
built the furnace and sealed it so that it would go up to four pounds of pure oxygen in it while they were operating. And this, of course, chases the reaction a lot faster and they can make the product faster. More than that, it makes a uniform product because they're trying to heat a very fine grain product and get the oxygen to it. And of course, the pressurized oxygen helps that work. So we make, but oxygen also has a characteristic that you get it hot and you've got a cutting torch. We're, we're building them up to 15, 20 pounds per square inch. And the next one that we're designing now, a very special one, is going to go to 320 pounds of oxygen. And at 300 pounds of oxygen, aluminum metal will burn. <laughs> thermite reaction. Yes, it would be just like a thermite bomb. Instead of magnesium, it will be aluminum. Yeah. So we have to use special combinations of cooling techniques and design so that the elements, which have to have some sort of a contact that normally is aluminum sprayed on the end that you can tie your electricity to, we have to make a special dispensation, keep it cool, and add, instead of using aluminum, we have to use copper and we have to braise it on there, so it's a special element that we've modified so that you can go to these high pressures in oxygen. <laughs> and there are several applications of, for uh, basic lenses. They're making a glass that conducts electricity, something like a TV screen, and they have trouble making it in, in the sh sheets very big because they make it in a big block and they can't get the oxygen to it uniformly without putting a lot of pressure on it. The important thing is if there is a job for a furnace to do, you design the furnace to do the job. You don't go buy an oven down at the grocery store and hope it works. <laughs>